It's a special time of year for us Jamaicans, wherever in the world we are. It's a month that draws us closer to shared experiences, like those wrapped in the threads woven to create our country's flag, or the national symbols that hold much of our cultural knowledge. Welcome to this special month with your Jamaica Magazine family. I'm Theodore Henry, always happy to take you through these moments. So, how about we head right into today's experience? <laughs> Today I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Wednesday, August 5. More social projects across the island will receive funding after the Jamaica Stock Exchange, JSE, launched its Innovating Social Sector Financing Project. The $910 million US dollar project was launched yesterday at the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel. It involves developing an ecosystem to assist social sector organizations with raising capital and resources to finance and bring projects to fruition via the JSE's Jamaica Social Stock Exchange platform. This project, which we are launching today, intends to facilitate the effective mobilization of resources to social service organizations and social enterprises that serve the poor and vulnerable population through this Jamaica Social Stock Exchange integrated systems and tools. The initiative is being facilitated under a technical cooperation agreement that was signed in December 2019 by the JSE and the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB. The IDB is providing $420,000 US dollars of the financing, while the JSE provides the remaining sum. 150 social service organizations will be targeted for assistance, including churches, foundations, nonprofit organizations, and social enterprises. Commissioner of Police Major General Anthony Anderson says the Jamaica Constabulary Force will be receiving the anticipated body cameras for its members in short order. He gave the update on Tuesday. And we went through quite an extensive procurement process. It lasted for about a year or more, or over a year. Um, but that's when you're procuring the sort of numbers that the JCF needs to procure of whatever it is, you find that it fits into that part of the procurement process that is needs cabinet approval needs all sorts of things um, but also what's more important is that we get the right things for our officers what what will work in the field and the type of operations and in our climate and in our conditions I think we're there now um, and so these body cameras are on their way the police commissioner was speaking as he joined National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang on a tour of the new JCF Specialized Operations Branch at Harmon Barracks in Kingston. The branch includes a Criminal Investigations Unit, Specialized Operations Intelligence Unit, Logistics and Administration, the Joint Information Operations and Command Center, and Special Weapons and Tactics, among others. Following the tour, Minister Chang stressed that government was committed to funding the development and modernization of the JCF. The investment today is not just to bring about the change in the facilities, change in the equipment, and ensure that you have a force for good that is capable of dealing with the criminals today. The police's corporate communications unit says to date, the specialized operations branch has seen significant upgrades in equipment, human resource, expansion of the facility, and advancements in technology. The Tourism Enhancement Fund, the TEF, has donated an ambulance to the Negril Fire Department in Westmoreland to improve its emergency response capabilities. The ambulance was bought at a cost of $18 million and handed over last Friday. As he addressed the function, Minister of Tourism Edmund Bartlett pointed out that fire departments were important in ensuring visitor safety on the island. This latest donation is in keeping with the TEF's ongoing partnership with the Negril Fire Department, to which it recently provided $7.6 million in support of renovation works. Deputy Commissioner in Charge of Operations at the Jamaica Fire Brigade, Kevin Houghton, says the partnership has not only upgraded the aesthetics of the Negril Fire Station, but has also lifted the morale of its over 48 members of staff. 
The approximately 43 wards housed at the Homestead Place of Safety for Girls are now enjoying an improved area for dining. This comes as over $150,000 was spent by the 2019 Civil Servant of the Year awardees on new tables and chairs to refurnish the area. A special presentation for the items was made recently at the facility in Stony Hill, St. Andrew. On behalf of our team at the CPFSA, my directors and our team here at Homestead, thank you for making the life of our ladies a little more homely for the 43, we now have 43 ladies here present. We are excited and so are they. The project was financed by First Heritage Credit Union Corporation Limited. It received additional support of extra chairs, tablecloth and balance, painting of the facility and tokens for the girls from other sponsors, including the Jamaica Information Service. To you, our kind-hearted sponsors, our colleagues, our family, our friends, who've extended the reach of your arms to the recipients of the Civil Servant, 2019 Civil Servants of the Year, and by extension, to the Homestead Place of Safety for Girls, we thank you. The execution of a community project that enhances the quality of life of fellow citizens is a key responsibility for recipients of the Civil Servant of the Year awardees. And finally, Culture Minister Olivia Grange says Jamaican musicians Shaggy, Marcia Griffiths and Ken Booth will be honored during the nation's independent celebrations on Thursday. The three will be presented with Jamaica Reggae Icon Awards at the Independence Spectacular, a virtual edition of the annual Independence Grand Gala on August 6. Minister Grange released a statement saying that while COVID-19 had forced many things to change, it would not stop us celebrating our country and outstanding Jamaicans. The independent spectacular will be held without an audience at the National Arena in keeping with the necessary restrictions on gatherings to reduce the spread of the virus. Only the awardees, performers, technical, organizing and management teams will be allowed at the venue. But persons can watch the event live on TVJ, PBCJ and on social media. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. The JIS Heritage Competition is celebrating 10 years of youth expression on Jamaican history, culture and tradition. Let me tell you about what Bashment Heritage. Jamaica still needs national heroes to preserve our cultural legacy. Bogo got his men and led them down over the hills to Spanish town. Jamaican music to me represents our identity and culture as Jamaicans. Add your voice and play your part in preserving our national heritage. The JIS Heritage Competition 2020, coming soon. Every color on our nation's flag tells a different story, and the object itself resonates with us in different ways. Well, through a single language, here's how some Jamaicans are sharing their stories about what this cultural symbol means to them. I've traveled all over the world and I've seen the Jamaican flag in so many different countries and it gives me a sense of pride. Representing my country and seeing the flag means everything to me. It's an honor playing for the national team. I've migrated for 19 years and have been living in the U.S. But there is no greater joy knowing how it has the power to connect us and bring us in the diaspora together. For me, the Jamaican flag is a language and it includes me in the conversations. When the Olympics start and um, I see the flag waving, it means a lot to us. Sunday, August 5, 1962, two minutes to midnight. The new flag was about to be hoisted over the National Stadium. The lights were replaced by darkness, as if to expunge the horrid memories of the last 300 years. The red, blue and white Union Jack did its last wave, and then it was lowered, gently tugged down the flagpole by a representative from the Jamaican militia. It had flown its course a long 307 years. And the replacement was the black, green and gold, our very own Jamaican flag. The Jamaican flag 
was approved by government the 6th of August 1962. It is important to know that a flag is a symbol which identifies a country. It started on a very sad note in war, times of war, people need to identify with a symbol. So where you are standing, you would know that's my side. So the enemy could take away the flag and then you would be ambushed and then get hurt. But on a joyful and peaceful note, our flag was established in 62 for our signal um, symbols. There was a very active competition and there were many persons who would want to associate with the design and so an approval was given. Looking at the flag is diagonal in gold and there are four triangles. The top and the bottom green and the others black. The gold, you know, represents sunshine, you know, happiness. You know, our people, no matter, no matter if we're going through hardship, we're always smiling. And the green is for our hope and agricultural resources. And the black, then in 62, means hardships they are. And that was changed by government in 1997 with a committee um, presided over by Professor the Honorable Rex Netterford. So it was changed to mean the creativity of the people. The flag has its protocol. It's never to be put on the ground and it is placed to the right when you're on the platform. Of course, with athletics international competition, you'll notice people are wrapping the flags all over them. Years ago, that was unheard of because it's a solemn signal. When the national anthem is played or sung, you look in the direction of the flag. We are proud of our flag and wherever we see it, there are some of us who still bow as respect to our dear country. When I'm overseas and I see the flag, I feel proud because, you know, not every country is at a big tournament. Not everyone will have their flag flying high. Our flag is so special because it unites our people wherever in the world we are. When I look down on the flag, it makes me feel proud as a Jamaican to know that I've been able to, to serve my country. So yes, the Jamaican flag gives me a voice. We also have deaf athletes going to represent Jamaica in other countries. And when other countries see our flag, you know, they feel proud and we feel proud as Jamaicans. The Jamaican flag represents pride to me. The other day someone said we should have a Caribbean flag and we said we already have one, it's the Jamaican flag. <laughs> Jamaican flags, it represent me, it represent you, it represent every Jamaican. We are no longer subjects of colonialism, directed by the orders of the British, but free citizens of our very own country. Oh, Green Isle of the Indies, Jamaica, strong and free. Our vows and loyal promises, oh, heartland, tis to thee. An important element that denotes the land of wood and water is, well, wood. You'd be surprised to know some of the rich history that seeps from the myriad of plants found at home. As we relish in our history, we're going to share just one of those with you, and that's the Blue Maho. The Blue Maho belongs to a family called Malvesi. Um, it's the same family that includes um, ornamental shrubs like shoe black. So the scientific name for the blue maho is Hibiscus elatus. I, I imagine that this, this, the specific name, which is the elatus, would indicate the fact that it is lofty and grows to, to great heights. The blue mahos, everyone knows, 
is our national tree. Jamaica has well over hundreds of native trees. Um, it's easy to understand that the, the combination of characteristics that makes the, uh, the maho unique is probably what gave it the edge over all those other hundreds of trees. The native range of the blue maho is to the northeastern corner of Jamaica, which is Portland, sections of the Junker Mountain. The blue maho blooms in the latter part of the, of the, of the, of the calendar. The typical color is a, f a kind of flaming reddish orange. It's more red than orange. The older the flower becomes, the redder it becomes. It bears a pod that splits um, in the drier part of the early uh, section of the year, the first quarter of the year. And the forestry department propagates the species by collecting the pods. We process them by drying them in trays and then we extract the seeds. The traditional uses is a fairly wide array. Um, it's used for furnishings, for furniture, um, for turnery, so you can make um, articles out of it. The beauty of it is not much seen when you just cut it, but when the furniture is made and you look at it, you see various colors and it goes in streak and streak. And they're not looking so nice until when they varnish it. it nothing, it's it not stained or anything, just when they polish it up when it's finished. So they use it a lot now. The strong, it reminds me of the lignum vitae. But that, the, the lignum vitae doesn't have those streaks in it like the blue maho. So it, it makes it very special. I think people confuse the name lignum vitae and the name blue maho with their, um, with their roles as national symbols, the one being the national flower and the other being the national tree. Parts of historical celebrations simply mean holiday and enjoyment for many and perhaps mischief for some. Now, while we want you to be safe, especially tomorrow, we also want you to know that for us, justice is being dispensed faster and faster day by day. So stay on the right side of life. And while you do that, here's a look at the latest push to a first-class justice system. It's 6 a.m. somewhere. Today's defense attorney may be rising to the alarm of a smartphone while the judge checks his email on a laptop. As the prosecutor does a quick LinkedIn or Facebook search, possibly while a court stenographer catches up with the news from a tablet, technology is moving and changing, easing or facilitating much of the activities in their lives. But now they take it from home to the chambers of work. Thank you so much for being here with us for this handover of audiovisual equipment to the Judiciary and the Court Administration Division. This important event on the grounds of the St. Catherine's Parish Court signifies another push and determined effort by the Ministry of Justice to make good on the promise of providing members of the public and stakeholders in the justice system with a first-class justice system. More and more, our justice system is being fueled and driven by advancements in technologies, and this marks the rollout of yet another phase. The St. Catherine Parish Court was the latest to be outfitted with technologies to aid and advance justice in Jamaica. Today's event signals the commitment 
of the Ministry of Justice to build a modern justice system that uses technology to improve our service delivery, enhance efficiency and accessibility, and give the citizens of Jamaica the justice service that they demand and deserve. The technological equipment received by the parish court is valued at $85 million. It is a reflection of partnership and commitment from the European Union and efforts of the Planning Institute of Jamaica, PIOJ, through the Justice Security Accountability and Transparency JSAP program. And just to give you a quick idea, ladies and gentlemen, of some of the equipment that is being handed over here today, But just why is it so important for us to equip our courtroom and the justice system, by extension, with all these technological advances? Well, they can assist with case scheduling and case flow management, therefore increasing the rate at which justice is dispensed. The digital and audio recordings will expedite the production of transcripts from court proceedings. One of the challenges that we have now, even at the Court of Appeal level, the statistics show that over 1,800 applications for appeals are pending. But of that eight, over 1,800 appeals, almost 1,000 are actually awaiting the transcript. Now, one of the things which people oftentimes notice and sometimes complain about is how long it takes a case to be actually dealt with because oftentimes in court, the parish judge or the Supreme Court judge is taking down everything by hand. And the reason for this is that the judge, especially where there's no transcription, want to make sure that they record the evidence. Now with this technology, it will not be necessary for the judge to take down verbatim everything because the transcript will be available. But the technology facilitates justice far beyond that because it will also be used to assist with hearing trials from the walls of correctional facilities. Because if we can provide the technology in the prisons or in the police stations, then persons who have a mention date or who have an application for bail can easily remain where he or she is in the police station or in the prison. And the technology is such that he or she can see exactly what is happening in the court. And the judge, the lawyer, everyone can see the person standing up in the dock in the jail or in the prison. And as the technology moves justice, it is also going mobile. We are now equipping two buses, two buses with the technology, so that to the extent that these two buses can be provided on a regular basis to the jail or police station where the audio equipment may not be there, then these buses could be used for those persons who are applying for bail or who may just have a mention date without them having to actually come to the court. These buses will also be used for witnesses, witnesses who are afraid to come to court. Or we're even looking at witnesses who have to be protected. And therefore, these witnesses could give their testimony from these buses at remote location. Today, in handing over a digital audio recording and video link technology system for use in the courts across the country, I am particularly pleased by the direct benefits that will result for vulnerable witnesses who will be able to give statements remotely. This is a significant contribution to witness protection, of which we can all be very proud. And there's more. One of the major benefits of this technology is that lawyers 
private attorneys should recognize that it can facilitate them enormously so that attorneys, if they're in Westmoreland, Hanover, and they have a case here in Kingston or in the, another parish, then they can easily sit in their office and participate without having to be actually in court. Also, when they have hearings, such as a bail application, sometimes even cases, they can actually stay in their office or stay from a remote location and do their cross-examination, examination, or pleading as the case may be. So technology is going to play a major, major role. And while all of this is happening, think about, at the end of the day, all these persons driving home through the invention of a vehicle while listening to the nightly news on the radio, or perhaps enjoying the sound of their favorite tunes coming through their AirPods. This is technology driving lives, pretty much in the same way it can drive our justice system. I believe Jamaica's ongoing justice reform activities reflect commitment and consensus on the part of the ministry and the judiciary. This is an essential ingredient for success. The Ministry of Justice, the government of Jamaica, is fully intent on providing the necessary resources to assist in achieving fair, timely, and efficient resolution of cases as we journey towards a first-class justice system. As we celebrate the things that create a true Jamaican experience, we also want to look at a few people who have helped in paving an even better Jamaica. Here goes. Number one, the lit guru Lorna Goodison. This Jamaican poet and author does extensive work on highlighting the historical, cultural, and social landscape of our homeland. Also a painter, Goodison has illustrated her own book covers, as well as exhibiting her artwork locally and internationally. The dominant Donald Quarry. This former track and field athlete was one of the world's top sprinters during the 1970s. He copped gold at the 1976 Summer Olympics in the 200 meters and silver in the 100 meters. Next, we have the pioneering Peter Tosh. The reggae musician's work closely threads along the lines of freedom and the struggle against injustice. His work entered the global charts with the classic cover, Walk, Don't Look Back, his duet with Mick Jagger, and he was awarded a posthumous Grammy Award for Best Reggae Performance in 1987 for No Nuclear War. Next, the captivating Charles Hyatt. This Jamaican-bred son is well known for his captivating skills as an actor, playwright, director, author, and broadcaster. He has also worked as a radio producer and presenter, and has written radio serials, such as Here Comes Charlie and When Me Was a Boy. The latter was published by the Institute of Jamaica Publications. How about we continue to build on these experiences as we all forge ahead to truly make Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. Another exciting journey ends here. We sure hope you learned something new or at least relived some significant Jamaican experience. Join us again tomorrow when some of our nation's leaders will give you their take on the period. Learning about our culture doesn't end with this half hour. In fact, do it at your own convenience on the JIS website. You can also follow us on our Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter pages. From all of us here at the GIS, have a great day. I'm Theodore Henry. See you soon. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.